Hello my David Squad, welcome back to another episode on David's show. In today's video, I will be covering part 2 of Nick Spencer's Amazing Spider-Man run. I will be covering from very left off, so we will start with issue 28 through issue 55. Now with that said, let's get right into the storyline. Beginning in issue 29, Peter is getting ready to have Mary Jane leave for two months to take part in a role for a play which Mysterio is behind, or that's what Volume 5 led us to believe. Unfortunately, nothing more is mentioned about that, but essentially he goes over to Aunt May for tips on how not to screw it over, before getting interrupted by his sister, Teresa Parker, who informs him she needs his help to defeat Chameleon, who killed the S.H.I.E.L.D. agent. And so Peter basically fucks up because of his great responsibility mantra yet again, as he has to go play the hero. MJ understands that, but Peter is left feeling guilty when he facetimes her. Next up, we see Kindred visiting Norman Osborn at the Ravencroft Institute, where we are given a hint at his identity. More on that later, though. And he has a talk about how Norman makes him feel powerless before we catch up to Peter, who is fighting Norman, who is occupying the Carnage Symbiote. Or who is occupied by the Carnage Symbiote. Uh, Peter has to save Dylan Brock and Normie Osborn. Unfortunately for poor Pete, he gets distracted by horrible memories of his past and is therefore unable to actually fight. So Peter gets knocked down. Knowing Norman is insane and thinks himself Cletus Cassidy, Peter gets up, knowing if he doesn't stop Norman now, he'll kill again. Norman is actually unable to kill Peter as Kindred planted a centipede in his head to kind of keep the Cletus personality from killing Peter. So therefore, I think Kindred has some kind of mind control powers, I don't know. Long story short though, in the larger scheme of absolute carnage, Carnage is killing Dylan and Normie because they once wore the symbiote. But of course, our hero Spider-Man beats Norman, Cletus, or whatever, Carnage this time, and hooray, let's get to Volume 7. Uh, so now we see Miguel O'Hara, better known as Spider-Man of the Year 2099, who crashes to Earth 616, and is currently held down by Roxon, who have no idea who he is. We then catch up to Peter, who is daydreaming about the recently gone Mary Jane, before being awoken by his fellow classmates at ESU, which he decided to go into. He meets a fellow classmate who redesigned an, an old webware watch, then he gets interrupted by Teresa again, and has to stop Chameleon from selling to the foreigner. He is then knocked out by Silver Sable, who is the foreigner's wife, before we catch up to Miguel again, who escapes the Roxon facility to find Peter Parker. Peter then wakes up from a total knockout and sees Teresa kill Silver Sable, who turns out is a robot, because Silver Sable is badly injured. The foreigner saved her and wanted to cure her. Now Sable tells Spidey that Simkaria is at war with Latveria, which means they're screwed. Catching up with Chameleon, he is talking to the talking to the current queen of Simkaria, who he works for, but backstabbed in a weird way, because he was actually selling to the foreigner. <laughs> now, he has hired someone to kill Dr. Doom, who is in New York currently. We then see Peter go to class late yet again, as predicted by his fellow student, who has now invented something that can see into other timelines and calculate what is likely to be the outcome. So basically, it's a time travel gizmo thingy. We cut off with a hitman targeting Dr. Doom, and the world is getting ready for, to, for full on war. We then see Miguel, who is trying to remember what happened. In the future, the timeline seems to have been getting ripped because of past Doom's choices. And so the 2099 Doc Doom told Miguel to go to the past and he escaped to find Peter but has no memories. Then we see Peter and his fellow classmate, who we learn is called Jamie, giving his device to Peter so he can get better power for it since Peter is super smart, or a better power source. Then we see that Doctor Doom has been shot and Peter goes to the place of Spider-Man. He of course knows it's a Doom bot, as Doctor Doom is always prepared. Out of the blue, Miguel comes to warn Peter. Miguel then leaves Peter, who sees a ton of Doom bots attacking New York for killing his robot. He does not take anything lightly, so Peter swings over the city, looking for help. All heroes are occupied besides his sister, Teresa, who joins him and tells him Chameleon works for the Queen of Simcaria, and he caused this havoc. And so they interrogate him. They basically get out on a dead end, struggling with how to defeat Doom, before Peter takes out the clairvoyant, which is now supercharged, thanks to Miguel. They decide to use the, that device to see outcomes, and they take the Chameleon with them. 
So we see Peter try many different outcomes before using a 51% of success one. Which, he lets Doom beat him up a bit before he tells him it's a trap. The hitman shot him and then got killed by Chameleon. Well, he didn't tell Doom who staged this, and so Spidey won. He talked it out. Doom being Doom, he doesn't leave without a little bit of terrorism and explosives, but the war is won. This volume ends with the Queen of Sincaria talking to Sable and telling her everything, telling her to get rest because she will need it. Now we catch up with Peter taking a swing around the city, stopping criminals per usual. He's currently using the clairvoyant to be on time to an online date with Mary Jane, watching a movie. <laughs> then we see J. Jonah Jameson talking to Nora Winters about a new job opportunity yet again, and now he's in. Kindred also leaves Peter a little message that it's time to get the show on the road. And well, he resurrects the Sin Eater. Now JJ arrives at Nora Winters with threats and menaces, and he's not liking the workers there, young and lazy, as he calls them. They then catch a glimpse of Spidey seeming to be committing a robbery. <laughs> JJ knows Peter is Spider-Man and goes to see what's going on. Now they catch up as the foreigner puts a bat on Spidey, a couple of robots try to kill him, what happens is JJ saved Peter from getting demolished and demands information. And so Peter tells him not to tell anyone about this. He was taking shield tech back from a bank. Uh, this was a shield mission and so Peter takes out the rest of the enemies and robots before seeing his phone. A newspaper article has reported Spider-Man on a secret mission. Jonah's fault and so Peter goes to him, infuriated. And fortunately for him, he got baited into doing a podcast with J. Jonah Jameson which just spirals downwards to an argument about who did who wrong and all that. Next up, they get attacked because the foreigner got someone to attack them, called Chance. Literally, the guy is called Chance. And on he fights until the foreigner decides to take over and have the jack-o'-lanterns attack him. They end up getting away with his web shooters, and so Peter swings home, and is greeted by Nora Winters giving him a job opportunity as well helping Spider-Man, or himself, get better reputation in media. We then learn that Jamie is actually a criminal by the name of the Clairvoyant, using his device, of course, and that Nora Winters is working for Chameleon. Next, we see Spidey in trouble fighting some vermin till Boomerang saves his ass, and they have a talk. So, Boomerang reveals they're going to be getting all pieces of the Lifeline tablet. Wilson Fisk is also trying to get it with high tech but Boomerang was given coordinates by some old man he saved, who gave him magic powers. And so that's what they've been up to, getting all pieces of the lifeline tablet. Unfortunately, one is stuck on the giant-sized Grog. Now, Grog was on his alien home planet till his owner died, and the mother of his owner gave him a piece of the lifeline tablet to protect before getting sent to Earth again. So, whoopsie. <laughs> and so a fight breaks out in the city. Grog chasing Boomerang for the Lifeline tablet through the city, wrecking everything in his path. Wilson Fisk and his goons trying to kill him. Peter trying to save him and stop Fisk. And so how do they win? Well, Spidey takes out two helicopters with his spider strength, webs up Fisk's mouth, and Peter and Boomerang throw a Boomerang into a truck, which Grog chases and goes small again. And so, Peter, Randy, and Fred have Grog as a house pet now. P.S. There were small snippets with a lethal le legion killing off someone and reforming. That's their sin and overdrive helping out demons killing someone. That's his sin. And that's important for the next volume, Sins Rising. Which is the start of less remains in my opinion. So the next three sections are focused on those. And so, we see our Peter Parker getting a nightmare thanks to Kindred, in which he is joined by Overdraft telling him his situation before getting killed by Sin Eater. This really isn't important, as this is just a nightmare within a nightmare, where Peter gets buried alive before waking up. The next day, Peter catches up with the actual Overdraft, who is going, aw going way too fast in the streets of Manhattan. Why? Well, he is being chased down by the Sin Eater. The Sin Eater manages to blow up Overdrive's car, and so Peter and him flee into a warehouse where Sin Eater comes up close and personal and fights Spidey. Spidey is knocked down and Sin Eater shoots Overdrive down. Peter learns that Sin Eater won't kill him though, as he is only serving Kindred. We later learn that Overdrive actually isn't dead, but rather his sins were written off and he's an innocent man. 
And then we see Peter fighting the lethal legion and keeping Sin Eater away from them. As Sin Eater freezes Pete into a rock and makes him watch him cleanse the sins from them. Sin Eater now has their powers too, as well as overdrives. Next up, we see that Nora Winters is getting her story about these cleansed villains, eliciting Ravencroft, now ruled by Norman Osborn. She then enters a parking lot greeted by Sin Eater. Nora somehow manages to escape. Sin Eater now has gathered an army of normal citizens who are at his will and mercy. Now this issue comes to a close with Peter getting beaten by Sin Eater with his newfound powers and the Ravencroft Asylum going absolutely crazy as a Sin Eater and his army are heading to take on Norman Osborn as their next victim. As we go to Volume 10, Sin Eater's army is way too large for Peter to handle his, on his own, and so he calls in help from his friend Miles Morales. He asks him for tips as they get closer and closer to the Ravencroft Asylum, whether to let Sin Eater do his work before stopping him or not. Turns out, Peter called more backup. Spider-Gwen, Madame Webb, Spider-Girl, Spider-Woman, and Silk. After some tips, Peter doesn't really listen. He still goes in to save Norman because of his moral compass. This is where he's true to the character, and if I may say so myself. And so the Order of the Web is formed as they must stop Spider-Man. Or rather, save him, since, spoiler alert, we don't get a fight. So, we catch up to Peter saving Norman's ass from, from Sin Eater's army. After learning that all of the spider people had nightmares about Peter getting killed by Norman, except Madame Webb, she's a kindred. Now, Sin Eater has found his way to the Juggernaut's cell in the facility, corrupting people with Martin Lee's powers. Yes, he clenched Martin Lee too. He uses Dr. Kafka, for example. Now, luckily, Peter and Norman entered a secret little hiding spot where Norman seems to be cooking up future evil schemes and he's adding his goblin suit there too. And so Peter and Norman are on their way, trying to escape the Institute, or Peter is. He's not doing too good, as the Sin Eater's army is huge. And then Norman comes back in his green goblin mantle, and they put on a hell of a fight, working together. Before we see Sin Eater again, who now is fucking ripped and possesses the power of the Juggernaut. And so the Ravencroft Institute gets fucked, as Peter and Norman find their way to another little secret lair, that Norman has. This is where they defeat the Sin Eater, getting him stuck in cement to have time to escape. Now sadly, Peter holding Sin Eater off so Norman can activate a device to make the cement softer so that Sin Eater gets stuck, Peter gets stuck too. And we see Norman backstab him before the Order of the Web saves his ass from Norman. And they flee in an escape pod before Peter makes his final decision to throw Norman out for Sin Eater to cleanse him. And the book comes to a close with Kindred finding himself in a cemetery. Alright, finally we're here. The big milestone. Last remains. Let's finish this plot breakdown because this is getting way too long. Kindred has actually dug up George Stacy, Uncle Ben, Gwen Stacy, among more people for the little party he's throwing for Spidey and company. But what's Peter doing? Well, he's getting thrown around the city as Norman Osborn gets cleansed by Sin Eater. Kindred, not having anything to do with Sin Eater anymore, kills him off, it seems. And Peter finds himself at Doctor Strange's Sanctum Centaurum, telling Strange the story. Well, essentially, Kindred has made the Order of the Web demonic, so he had a brawl with some of them and managed to escape to get some help. Norman Osborn being cleansed now gets Doctor Kafka to help him find Kindred and stop him. And well, Peter and Doctor Strange decide to use a magic thingy to get to Kindred's current location. And it doesn't work so. Peter is thrown out as Doctor Strange goes in a separate way to help the currently possessed Order of the Web. But turns out Peter got Black Cat to steal this magic thingy, so he uses it by himself to get to Kindred's location. And so, seeing friends and loved ones' corpses as well as Kindred makes Peter furious as he attacks Kindred. Kindred easily stomps Peter, but Peter does get a few good licks. Kindred throws Peter outside New York, seeing the Order of the Web destroying New York. Peter feels it's his, re his responsibility and begs Kindred to take him instead. So Kindred breaks Peter's neck, killing him. And so the Order of the Web is safe. Next up, Kindred decides to revive Peter, only to reveal the man under the mask, Harry Osborne. Peter of course wants to help him, but Kindred attacks him again, and they break into a fight. K 
Kindred kills Peter about five times to let him see a glimpse of what hell is like. And as the issue comes to a close, Kindred wants Peter to confess his sins, which Peter doesn't really know what they are. And the Order of the Web and Mary Jane are at the location. So, what happened? Well, Norman got Mary Jane to help him, as well as Kingpin, actually. So like, let's break down issue 55. So as Mary Jane enters the scene, the Order of the Web are stuck, and so is Peter. But when he sees MJ and that Kindred could easily kill her, here and now, he breaks free and absolutely smashes the graveyard, trying to defeat Kindred, who seems to be an immortal demon. Kindred, of course, easily defeats Spider-Man, so Mary Jane gets Peter to calm down and eat. Then we see Norman Osborn, informing Kingpin that Mary Jane is in. And so Kindred is furious again, and takes it out on the Order of the Web and Peter, before Mary Jane stops him and tells him to take her instead. And so Norman enters as the Green Goblin, putting on an act or ruse, fighting him before telling Kingpin to start his thing now. Essentially, the issue ends with a little explosion that seems to kill off Mary Jane. And so the run is starting to get heated. I still think the writing on this run has been spectacularly done by Nick Spencer. He just, as I said last time, really gets Peter moral compass. And the Mary Jane-Peter relationship aspect, although I would like a deeper exploration of it, is pretty good so far. We haven't seen a lot of them together, unfortunately, yet. I also like the aspect aspect of having Peter be more average now than in Dan Slot's run. The guy is back in school again now, and seems to now have a job as well in the news business, which is pretty old school stuff. Nick Spencer is really, really doing good things with Peter as a character and moving him in the right direction. Now the J. Jonah Jameson things are also written well, and he continues to have a fresh new little relationship with Peter. Now let's get to the whole Kindred saga. So, we saw tiny little glimpses of him through Volume 1 and 10, which are like 49 issues of barely anything but small setups. I think that's a little too long of a wait. Say, two year wait? Yeah, it's been a pretty long wait. And well, I simply think Last Remains doesn't really give us its all. It's good, but not great. But the lead up is well written. Kindred resurrecting Sin Eater, hunting Peter's nightmares, taunting Norman Osborn, and also seeing Green Goblin back briefly is fun. So from volume 9 and 10, we have some amazing build up to the so-called main event, which is pretty lackluster. We don't really see what Peter's sins are, although speculation say it has to do with one more day, which it might be. There's no clear little thing about Kindred's motivations and what he wants Peter to confess to, but we do get cool fights and the stakes are certainly high too. And Nick Spencer keeps it strong enough with Peter's direction. I hope he does write Kindred better in the future so we can get a clear example of his motivations and what Peter's sins are. Because honestly, last remains, the Kindred part is horribly written. Alright, let's talk about the artwork since, well, Ryan Otley leaves in volume 10, his last issue being issue 49. And well, I really enjoyed his art on the book and I will miss it. Also in volume 9 and 10, we get a lot of art by Mark Bagley. It's great seeing him draw on Spider-Man again, as he is one of the greatest Spider-Man artists of all time, and his art just really pops. So here's a few panels for you from Volume 11, Issue 54. Now let's talk about the new artist, Patrick Gleason, who first sees some of his work in Volume 7, and I was like, mm -hmm. no, Ryan Otley is better. But then seeing his work on Last Remains, it's spectacular. Patrick Gleason's art is really amazing. It has detail, good fight choreography, and good color schemes. And I just can't wait to read more issues of this run and seeing more of his art and hopefully better writing for Kindred. Now, this rounds up the plot of volume six through 11, as well as my opinions. So in conclusion, Nick Spencer's Amazing Spider-Man run continues to be pretty good compared to Dan Slott's run. And I'm happy to say I can recommend this run to any fan who wants to get into Spider-Man. Nick does take a nosedive into bad quality when it comes to writing Kindred though, which isn't really that good as Kindred has been hyped up so bad. So as I said, I'm hoping to see more of him and Patrick Gleason's art. That said, I will give this run so far a 7.8 out of 10. Seeing as a slight worse quality in writing with Kindred, whew, finally over. Well, 
I'm your host David and uh, feel free to like, comment and subscribe. And I'll see you in another episode on David Show.